Most inventors dream their creations will change history, not end it. In 1900, French engineer Henri Thuy set out to solve the deadly visibility flaw of steam locomotives, unveiling a massive machine with a forward cab and a 210 pounds per square inch pear-shaped boiler determined to break speed barriers across Europe. Three weeks later, that same pursuit of safety killed him. His head struck a signal post, blinded by the very force he tried to conquer. The French locomotive that killed its inventor is more than a tragedy. Its bizarre design and fatal irony reveal how ambition can turn salvation into catastrophe. But what really made this engine so dangerous? And why did its promise collapse so quickly? Steam locomotives, for all their power and grandeur, forced their drivers to peer out from a cramped cab behind a wall of steel and fire. Visibility was the problem. The boiler, a massive cylinder running nearly the length of the engine, blocked any clear view ahead. At speed, signals and obstacles could appear out of nowhere, leaving only seconds to react. Accidents were common, and the cost in lives was real. In 1894, Gaston Dubus, a respected French railway official, declared that trains should be running at 120 kilometers per hour. But the reason they weren't was simple. They couldn't. Not safely, not with the old designs. That challenge landed like a gauntlet in the mind of a young engineer named Henri Thuil. Thuil grew up in Alexandria, Egypt, surrounded by the restless energy of ports, steamers, and the iron rails that stitched continents together. He arrived in France with a reputation for sharp thinking and a stubborn streak that bordered on obsession. The era was intoxicated by speed. The Orient Express had captured the world's imagination, promising luxury and adventure across Europe, but no single locomotive could haul its opulent carriages the entire way. Trains changed engines at borders and mountain passes, each swap a reminder of technical limits. Thuil saw a future where one revolutionary engine could do it all, faster, safer, and more elegant than anything before. But the barrier was always the same, the driver's view. Every railway man knew the stories, missed signals, split-second decisions, tragedies that could have been avoided if only someone had seen a little farther down the track. Thuil took this hazard personally. He believed that true progress meant not just more power or speed, but a fundamental change in how a locomotive worked. He became obsessed with the idea of putting the engineer where he belonged, right at the front, with an unbroken view of the rails. No more guessing what lay ahead. No more trusting luck and reflexes to keep disaster at bay. As Twill sketched out his vision, he set his sights on more than just a technical fix. He wanted to build the ultimate express locomotive, a machine that could pull a luxury train from Paris to Vienna without stopping at speeds that would make Dubus's 120 kilometers per hour more than a boast. He imagined a single, majestic engine leading the charge across borders, through night and storm, with the driver perched at the prow like a ship's captain. It was a bold answer to a deadly problem, and it would demand a design as radical as the ambition behind it. For Twil, the visibility flaw was not just an engineering nuisance, it was a personal challenge, a call to action that would consume years of his life and eventually cost him everything. The old ways were not enough. He would build something the world had never seen. And in doing so, he hoped to make the rails safe at speed for the first time. The dream was set. Now, only the execution remained. Blueprints for Tool's locomotive sprawled across the table revealing an unconventional machine that broke every rule of its era. At the center stood a boiler, unlike any other, an upside-down pair, double-lobed, and built from nickel steel, braced by three layers of lateral stays. Most engineers dismissed such shapes as dangerous, convinced only a perfect cylinder could survive the relentless pressure of steam. The wheel disagreed, his design bulging and asymmetric, was put to the test, 
The pressure gauge soared past 210 pounds per square inch, and the vessel held firm. For a boiler of this form, it was an astonishing result, proof that Tuil's calculations and choice of nickel steel had paid off. The wheels were just as radical. Four driving wheels, each two and a half meters in diameter, towered above the drafting floor. No French express engine had ever rolled on wheels this large. Thuil argued that bigger wheels would mean fewer revolutions, less wear, and a smoother ride at speed. The rest of the arrangement, four leading wheels up front, six trailing behind, spread the locomotive's weight over 14 points, stretching the frame to a formidable 14 meters. With its 10-meter tender, the entire train reached nearly 24 meters, dwarfing anything else on the rails. Thuil moved the cab to the very front, ahead of the boiler, giving the engineer an unobstructed view of the track. Every control, throttle, brakes, sanders, whistle, was routed forward. The firemen, stationed at the rear, fed coal into a double-doored Bell Pair firebox. Communication between the two relied on an acoustic tube and bells, a system that seemed both ingenious and precarious, especially in moments of crisis. Inside the boiler, steam wound through a labyrinth of pipes and stays, each calculated to balance the violent shifts of heat and pressure. Nickel steel plates, chosen for their resilience, formed a skin that resisted both corrosion and rupture. When the first pressure test was run, the gauge climbed past 210 pounds per square inch without a hint of strain. The boiler did not just survive, it excelled a rare victory for unconventional engineering. Other features read like a modern wish list. Walshirt's valve gear for reliability, Westinghouse air brakes, a dynamo to light the carriages, and a water tank sized for the longest hauls. The cylinders, each 510 by 700 millimeters, fed power to those giant wheels. The tender held seven tons of coal and nearly 30 tons of water, enough for a non-stop run from Paris to the border. The locomotive seemed fully equipped for high-speed service. Yet for all its promise, questions lingered. Could just four powered wheels grip the rails? Would the 14-meter frame handle tight curves? Could driver and fireman, separated by a mountain of steel, work together in an emergency? On paper, Thuil's machine was ready. Whether it would run as imagined was another question entirely. The 1900 Paris Exposition drew crowds from across the world, each visitor eager to catch a glimpse of the wonders on display. In the vast halls devoted to industrial progress, one machine stood out, a locomotive longer, taller, and stranger than anything else in the pavilion. Schneider and C had positioned Tuil's creation front and center its nickel-steel skin polished to a mirror shine, the double-lobed boiler bulging like the chest of some mechanical beast. Placards promised a revolution in railway travel, touting the forward cab, the oversized wheels, and the promise of speed that would finally rival the legends of the Orient Express. Spectators gathered in throngs, craning their necks to see into the forward cab and marveling at the sheer scale of the driving wheels each one taller than a grown man. Children pointed, railwaymen traded technical guesses, and journalists scribbled notes, their columns already filled with speculation. Some called it the future of French engineering, a bold answer to the continent's hunger for speed. Others whispered doubts, poking at the odd shape of the boiler, or the risky distance between driver and fireman. The press? never one to miss a spectacle. Split along familiar lines, Le Matin praised the locomotive's ambition. While Le Journal des Transports questioned whether such a machine could ever be practical on real tracks, technical journals published diagrams and sectional drawings dissecting the pear-shaped boiler and the labyrinth of pipes running through its heart. The Walshirt's valve gear and Westinghouse brakes earned nods of approval but then came the caveats. Letters to the editor poured in, some from seasoned engineers, others from hobbyists, raising concerns about the untested weight distribution, 
the challenge of maintaining such a complex boiler, and the wisdom of separating the crew across so much steel. The acoustic tube and bell system, meant to bridge the gap between driver and fireman, drew as much skepticism as admiration. For every admirer who saw a new dawn in railway travel, there was a skeptic who saw folly in the details. The engine's sheer size raised eyebrows. Over 80 tons, stretching nearly 24 meters with its tender, it loomed over standard rolling stock like a battleship among fishing boats. Yet the promise was intoxicating. The idea that a single locomotive could pull a luxury train from Paris to Vienna without pause, with the engineer perched at the very front, eyes on the horizon. As the days of the exposition passed, the locomotive became a fixture in press coverage, a favorite subject for caricaturists and technical commentators alike. Some called it the monster of the fair, others, the ship of the rails. But beneath the excitement, a question lingered in every conversation. Could this machine do more than dazzle onlookers? The crowds demanded a demonstration. The press wanted numbers, not just promises. Tuile's locomotive had captured the imagination of Paris, but now it would have to prove itself where it mattered most, on the rails. Testing began on a stretch of the Chemin de Fer de l'État, running between Chartres and Tuar. State officials arrived in crisp uniforms, joined by a hand-picked crew, driver, fireman, and a clutch of engineers with notebooks ready. The train behind the new locomotive weighed in at 180 tons, loaded with carriages meant to simulate a full luxury express. All eyes were on the rails. The engine rolled out of the yard, its massive two and a half meter driving wheels turning with a deep, measured rhythm. Signals flashed past. Steam hissed through the labyrinth of pipes inside the pear-shaped boiler, the pressure gauge steady above 210 pounds per square inch. In the forward cab, the driver gripped the controls, eyes fixed on the track ahead, a view no other engineer in France had ever commanded at this speed. Communication with the firemen, stationed far behind, came in the form of metallic clangs and muffled voices through the acoustic tube, a system that worked, for now. As the train gathered speed, the crew pushed the throttle open. The locomotive surged forward, the wheels spinning with purpose. On a long, straight section of line, the needle on the speedometer crept upward. 80 kilometers per hour, then 90, then 100. The carriages rattled and swayed, the steel frame of the engine flexing under the strain. Officials watched their pocket watches, counting off the seconds between mileposts. At full tilt, the locomotive reached 117 kilometers per hour a number just shy of the legendary 120 km per hour target that had inspired Tuil's design. It held that speed for a stretch, hauling the full 180-ton load without a hint of boiler trouble. The giant wheels, so often doubted, proved steady. The boiler, for all its odd shape, delivered power in a smooth, even stream. The dynamo lit the carriages, the Westinghouse brakes responded on cue, and the Walshart's valve gear ticked away like a metronome. For a brief moment, it seemed the impossible had been achieved. Newspaper headlines the next day would boast of the 117 kilometers per hour run, hailing the engine as a marvel of French ingenuity. The test crew, exhausted but exhilarated, stepped down from the cab with a sense that history had been made or at least that the future had arrived, but the gap between promise and perfection was already clear. The locomotive had delivered numbers, real, impressive numbers, but the target remained just out of reach. On paper, the dream was close. On the rails, it was still a few kilometers short. Track inspectors watched with a mix of awe and anxiety as Tuil's locomotive rumbled onto the main line. The machine weighed in at over 80 tons, more than any French Express engine before it. On paper, that heft promised stability and power. In practice, it threatened the rails themselves. 
French mainlines were built for engines that could handle curves as tight as 300 meters, but Tuile's 24-meter Colossus needed at least 500 meters. Anything sharper and the frame groaned, wheels screeched, and the risk of derailment soared. The first test runs exposed this incompatibility in brutal detail. Approaching a standard curve, the engine's long wheelbase forced the leading and trailing wheels to fight for space. Metal flanges bit into the rails, sending up showers of sparks. On one run, the locomotive's rear trucks lifted just enough to threaten a jump. Inspectors measured the gouges left behind, shaking their heads. The engine simply could not bend with the track. Incompatibility. But the most damning flaw lay hidden beneath the spectacle. Traction. Only four of the engine's 14 wheels were powered the massive 2.5-meter driving wheels at the center. Despite its bulk, just 40% of the locomotive's weight pressed down on these wheels. The rest was carried by unpowered axles, meant to spread the load, but not to grip the rails. For comparison, most express locomotives of the era put 60 to 70% of their weight on the drivers, ensuring enough friction to translate raw power into forward motion. Thuil's design left his engine with a mathematical handicap. Even if the boiler and cylinders delivered their full force, the drivers would spin helplessly at speed, unable to hold the track. During acceleration, the crew watched as the wheels slipped and struggled for purchase, especially on damp mornings or loose ballast. The engine could reach impressive speeds on straight, dry track, but every curve and every patch of slick rail threatened disaster. The numbers were undeniable. 80 tons of ambition, but only four points of traction, an equation that doomed the locomotive to fight the rails it was meant to conquer. Fatal moment. Three weeks after the debut, the locomotive's promise ended with a single, brutal accident. Henri Tuile, the man who had spent years fighting for a safer view of the rails, was killed by the very danger he had tried to eliminate. The details have never been settled. According to the French National Railway Museum, Tuile was thrown from the footplate after a derailment, one last catastrophic failure of an engine that never fit the tracks. But most other accounts, including the technical press and later railway histories, tell a more ironic and more haunting story. Tuile, standing in the forward cab, leaned out to inspect the track ahead. A line side post, or perhaps a bridge support, struck his head. The locomotive did not derail. The engineer who wanted to see further than any before him was killed by the very visibility his design had promised. No official investigation report survives. The newspapers of the day offered only brief, sometimes contradictory notes. There are no surviving logbooks, no dispatches, no eyewitness statements in the archives. What is certain is that testing stopped that day. The engine was quietly returned to Schneider and C, never to run again. Stored. For four years, the locomotive sat in storage. A monument to ambition and unintended consequence. In 1904, it was cut up for scrap, its short life reduced to a footnote in the ledgers of Le Creusot. The tender, oddly enough, lingered on. It was still listed in the inventory at St. Pierre des Corps. As late as 1946, its purpose lost to time. Whether it carried water for another engine, served as a coal wagon, or simply gathered dust in a siding, no one seems to know. Final irony. Tweel's name faded from the papers, and his experiment was quietly forgotten by the industry he had hoped to transform. The final irony remains inescapable. The locomotive built to solve the visibility problem ended up costing its inventor his head. In the end, it became a cautionary tale, proof that not every solution is safer. And sometimes, the greatest risks come from the things we can finally see. Today, rail safety depends on design born of hard lessons. Nearly 1,000 train drivers lose their lives globally each year often to visibility and communication failures. Automation promises to solve old dangers, yet human ingenuity still collides with risk. The line between progress and peril remains thin. 
and every innovation tests where it's drawn next. 